Pastor Mike online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike and I am online and I am live with you today. Good to be and this will be no doubt the talk show Hell Hate. I'm going to put a graphic up on the skein uh, on the skein right away. And um, I am also going to monitor the emails today because I'd like for you to write in and let me know uh, maybe a story that you have concerning maybe a past church experience, a uh, conference that you went to, some sort of uh, gathering, meeting, or something you watched on quote-unquote Christian television, TBN, or whatever, where they talked about the fl the flame or the fire, and everybody was going to be ignited with the fire, and people, we're going to bring the fire of God down from heaven, and and all of that stuff. And, and so if you have a... Um, if you have a personal testimony about that, if that's something that uh, is in your past or just anything you see, uh, the email to write there is on the bottom of the screen, pastormikeonline at gmail.com. Uh, I would like to hear your thoughts, and if you want me to, I will read those uh, online. And uh, if you don't want me to mention your name, then put it at the beginning of the email and not at the end, down at the bottom of the email. Because then I read the email and then, then, then you say, now please, Pastor Mike, whatever you do, don't mention that my name is whatever. Okay? So anyway, just kind of do it that way. But anyway, I'd be looking forward to your emails there. And uh, this is from a uh, this is from a church website, Ignite. Uh, what wh what are they igniting? And I am I am just very distrusting nowadays, and rightfully so, of um, the the language that's being used in churches nowadays concerning fire and flames and the fire of God and we need the fire of God and we're going to set this whole church on fire. I mean, that sounds like something you could get arrested for, right? Um, well, you know, we're going to call fire down from heaven because if you remember, there's a guy named False Prophet who is going to call fire down from heaven. Remember that. It's, it's part of the lying signs and wonders package that is going to deceive people and is deceiving people right now in the days that you and I are living in. And so just kind of, kind of be thinking about that. Um, I want us to get your Bible out and uh, let's look at a couple of places in the scriptures. We've been talking about this on Wednesday night. Uh, we're doing a, a study on the book of 1 Peter. Uh, I love 1 Peter uh, because it is, it's, it's one of those books that, number one, I was told to not read by some King James only people. They said, oh, you can't, you can't study 1 Peter. That's not for us. That's for the Jews. Don't you know that? Well, I, the reason why I don't know that is because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say it, then I don't believe it, and you can't make me believe it. How's that? But anyway, we're doing a study of First Peter, and I, I am convinced um, that before you and I are translated from this world, to heaven. I believe that we are going to see and endure hardship and trials and times of temptation. And can I say, can I say the other T word? See, I've said trial and temptation 
And there's a T word that, dare I say it? I, I will. I, I'll say it because, because the Bible says it. Tribulation. See, I, I believe, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, that there is a time appointed of tribulation. Now, the Bible does not say anywhere that a time of tribulation has to be seven years. Does not say that anywhere. Doesn't say, it doesn't say it. Doesn't say that it's three and a half years either. Doesn't say it, doesn't say it that way either. Um, but I, I believe that a time of tribulation, I believe, let, let me read, let me read to you what I believe from first Peter. And I, and I just touched on this last night. Um, first Peter chapter one, there's actually two places in first Peter where he mentions this and he mentions it both times in relation to the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When he appears in the air, you and I are going to be caught up with him to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, says we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time I like it the last time wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations there's one of those t words temptation have you ever been tempted have you ever passed that time of temptation have you ever failed that time of temptation? I have, and you have too. We fail it. We pass it sometimes, but we fail it sometimes. And every time we fail, God then is victorious in our life because there's not a time that goes by where God is not claiming victory over us, over our lives, over some aspect of our lives, somehow, some way. That's what Paul said. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph. Always. God is always triumphing over some area of our life. God is conquering things. Even when we fail, God is triumphing. So he says... Uh, he mentions manifold temptations, and then he mentions the other T word in verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. Notice this, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When is a trial of fire coming? It's coming at the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's what I believe. Now, again, I have, and I, I'm not trying to be mean about this. I'm not trying to uh, start a fight. I certainly uh, am not going to get invited to some churches because of what I have already said on this issue and what I'm about to say. But I, I, I have been told by so many people that it's a shame that I get my doctrine from books like 1 Peter. It's a crying shame that Hoggard is doing that. It's a, it's a shame that he reads the four Gospels and believes that those are for him. It's a shame that he reads Hebrews and thinks that Hebrews has something to do with him and his salvation. 
It's a shame that he's reading Jude and Revelation and the letters of John and First and Second Peter and the four Gospels and the Old Testament, thinking that those have something to do with what he should believe out of the Bible. I, I have, there have been people who have said of me, Mike Hoggard's he's going to, he's going down. He is, he's going down. He's, he's not going to make it because of what he believes. And yet I find no place in the Bible. I find no place in the Bible or I am prohibited from believing the Old Testament, the New Testament, the four Gospels, Acts, Hebrews, John's letters, Peter's letters, Jude, James, Revelation, all the basically all the all of the books that John did or that Paul didn't write. I find no place in Scripture that I am not supposed to regard those books as being doctrinal. No place whatsoever. And again, if the Bible doesn't say it, I don't, I don't believe it. I can't believe it. I'm not allowed to believe it. So I believe that my Bible is for me and to me and has the plan of God in it for what he's going to do in the last days. And what it is, there are things written in these books that some people don't like. They don't, it doesn't match their doctrine. Doesn't match what they wrote in their, in their books. And since it doesn't match what's in their books, they just simply, somebody came up with this idea. Well, if it doesn't match with what we say, then obviously this book isn't for us. It must be for somebody else. I, I can't do that with the Bible. I can't. So he, he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, I would just ask you a simple question. How's your faith doing? How is your faith? Do you believe what God said? Do you believe what the Bible says? Can someone draw you away from what the Bible says? Because I can tell you there's enough stupid people out there and enough false prophets out there that are drawing people away right and left. There's enough of them out there th that have the ability to draw large portions of people away from what the Bible says. I've seen it, I've seen it many, many times. I've seen people come to the Lord. I've seen people yield their life over to the Lord Jesus Christ only to have some wolf or some false prophet pull them away from the simplicity of the gospel. And I would encourage you, don't do it. Don't fall for it. it have God increase your faith for you, and God can do it. Let me tell you why. Uh, hold your place there in First Peter. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians. In Second Thessalonians, we're told that a great, big, huge, monstrous lie is going to be told. We're told in verse nine, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the see it's about belief, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure 
and unrighteousness. When you believe the truth, you believe the Bible because the Bible is truth. Jesus said, thy word is truth. And I, I don't know what this, I don't know what this grand deception is going to be. I think it does have something to do with the revelation of the Antichrist, the man of sin. I think it has something to do with the introduction of the beast and his doctrine and his gospel and the spirit. Remember, that's what Paul warned us about, another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. I think it has something to do with that. But there's no doubt in my mind that there's coming a time when a lie is going to be told. And that lie is going to be believed by people. Now, I, I, I'm going to, I'm, I, I want to, oh, I'm, I'm holding some things back. What I want to do is go punching, and I'm trying to pull some punches here. I've talked, I talked the other day about the Mandela effect. And believe it or not, there are still people out there who believe it. I, I don't, it, it just, I, I, can't, I can't fathom in my mind how people are so gullible and so blind that they actually believe that someone is going back in time and messing with all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the Bible, messing with song lyrics, messing with cartoon characters, messing with all kinds of stuff that have no relevance whatsoever. The Baron, is it the Berenstein Bears? Oh, no, it's the Berenstein Bears. Oh, no, I remember it as the Berenstein Bears. That means, that must mean somebody went back in time and changed it. But then, then the idea that somebody's going back in time and changing Bible verses right, right, right in front of us. Because we all know, we all know the Bible said wineskins. We all know the Bible said wineskins. And now it says bottles. And everybody knows bottles wasn't in use. Bottles is recently with Pepsi and, and Coca-Cola. And I'm just telling you, the Bible's incorruptible, can't be changed. No, I don't care. It's been tried every way in the world. And if someone did figure out how to go back in time and change the Bible, I guarantee you God would change it back before they ever got back. It's incorruptible. It can't be corrupted. And yet there's people out there that believe that it has been. It's been tampered with. Oh, my goodness. You see, that's a lie that's been told, and people fell for it. And I'm saying this, it, I'm, I, I want to, I'm trying to say this in love because I get, I mean, I understand what it's like to be lied to. I have been deceived before. Back years ago, 20, I'm going to say 24 years ago, the Jehovah's Witness came to my door and they messed my head up for a whole afternoon. They had me going there for a while, and God finally just, Mike, cut it out. God showed me how they work. God showed me how they manipulated everything. And I stuck my head back in the Bible, and I read 1 John 5, 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And I'm going, okay, it's settled. I believe what God said, period, the end. I believe it. It's in the Bible. And that was during a time when I didn't believe that the King James was the only word of God in English. I had already purchased NIV Bibles for some of the young people in our church. I was out at Richwoods. And so I get it. I mean, I'm not trying to act like I've never been lied to before or never believed something that isn't true. Because at that time... I had fallen for what I was taught in Bible college, that all the Bibles had mistakes in them, and I needed to learn Greek. I needed to, I needed to learn how to open up a, a Greek and Hebrew lexicon so that I could stand up in front of everybody and tell everybody what the Bible really says. 
not what their Bible says. I fell for that lie, so I understand it, but God pulled me out of it. And if you have if you have mistakenly believed something that isn't true, ask God to show you the truth. Ask God, and he will show it to you. But to think that people are going back in time and messing with the Bible is just, it's ridiculous. But it's a lie that people have fallen for. Some people have fallen for it, lock, stock, and barrel, and they're not going to change their mind. Something that ridiculous, something that bizarre and crazy-headed, they fell for it. Can you imagine what they're going to fall for when this great deception is unleashed on planet Earth? They're going to they're going to fall all over themselves for that one. They're going to they're going to believe it. They're going to accept it. They are. And I I don't want to get into other things that I just have a serious serious problem with. Okay, I'll say it. The earth is not flat. It's not. The trial of your faith, the trial of your faith, do you believe what God said? Do you believe every word of God is pure? And when God speaks, he speaks plainly. In a very plain fashion, if God wants you to believe something, he says exactly what he wants you to believe. It's that simple. Now turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed. See, there it is again. When his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So twice here in 1 Peter, he mentions in in chapter 1, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. And both of them have, are, are mentioned in the context of the glorious appearing of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, in verse 13 of chapter 4, When his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And so I believe that I I believe that there is a time coming a time of fire on this earth and what that fire is and what it's for where does it come from what it, what what is its design how does it fit into the study of bible prophecy this is uh, one of the things that we'll, ex- well, it's the biggest thing that we'll explore today. Um, I want to check emails. Uh, yeah, here we go. How you doing, Kate? Um, she says, hi, Pastor Mike. In relation to your subject, at my old church, they held an Ignite Christian gathering for the youth uh, from the... Um, Elim Church, I'm not sure what that is, but anyway, around the UK, they're from Great Britain, her and her son. Um, I was disturbed by the idea of a music festival type gathering for the children. I never went. And basically, Kate, it, it was going to be a big rock concert, it's what it was going to be. Uh, I heard that they do fire tunnels there, and they call down the spirit. They also would do prayers by facing north, south, east, and west. That's witchcraft. This is what she's writing me. By the way, the Elam churches are all founded by the Four Square Gospel Alliance and have deep roots in the Churches Together program here in the UK. Churches Together. You know what that is? That's ecumenical movement, which is led by Rome, the Vatican, 1963. 
the Second Vatican Council, Pope John the Twenty Third directed, and it was approved. This was the plan that we're going to we're going to quit killing the Baptists. We're going to quit trying to kill all of the Protestant churches. What we're going to do is we're going to infiltrate. We are going to um, get involved in their programs, in their denominations, in their seminaries. We are also going to get involved in their Bible. This is why you see um, Cardinal Martini, a Jesuit priest, sitting on the Greek New Testament Committee from the United Bible Society. The Vatican succeeded in planting a Jesuit. Now, he was not undercover, mind you. He was not dressed in a suit and tie and had a wife and, you know, had, had posed as a seminary professor. This was a backward-collar-wearing Jesuit priest, liberal Jesuit priest, who was sent by the Vatican to get in the council with uh, Alec Wittgren and uh, Kurt Aland and uh, Bruce Metzger. And there was a couple other guys on this committee. These are all names I remember from Bible college. And these guys developed what was to be the accepted Greek New Testament for all the churches, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, so that all the new Bibles... All the new Bibles, NIV, New American Standard, Holman Christian Standard, the Message Bible, the Revised English Version, today's English Version, whatever version it was other than the King James, they're all based upon the Greek text that was put together by a Jesuit priest. That was the Vatican Council's plan. Let's, let's infiltrate, let's get involved, let's plant guys in strategic positions so that in just a matter of a, of a few decades, we can unite all of the churches together under the umbrella of Rome. And it's working, working right now. Uh, most of, she writes, most if not all churches here uh, in her part of England are joined one to another by these by this churches together union hope this is helpful kate i i absolutely it is they held an ignite christian gathering they're going to they're going to they're going to ignite the divine spark that's inside of everybody they had fire tunnels do you know what that is bill johnson and the anti bethel church out in Redding, California, I call them that because they're not this Bethel Church. I, be, believe it or not, I had a lady call. Um, it sounded like an older lady. Uh, several months ago, she called here, and I answered the phone, and she said, is this Bethel Church? And I said, yes. And she said, um, well, I'd like to come and visit your church. I said, well, that's great. When? She said, well, in a couple of weeks. I said, fantastic. Man, we'd love to have you here. I said, uh, you know, we'd just love to, for you to we have people come visit us all the time from around the world. She said, okay. She said, I'm planning a trip to California and, you know, would like to come by there. And I said, California. She said, yeah. I said, well, you know, that's quite a bit of ways from St. Louis, but you can get here. She said, St. Louis? I said, yeah, this is, you've reached a church that's, we're about 30 miles straight south of St. Louis. She said, oh, I've called the wrong Bethel church. I wanted the one in Redding, California. And I went, oh my goodness. So, Ma'am, that's not us. Poor lady. But anyway, um, the anti-Bethel church, Redding, California, I don't know if they started this or they stole it from other people, but they were doing fire tunnels. These people would line up on both sides 
you got to get this now. Line up on both sides. And people would, and that would be the fire, and they would hold their hands over like this, touching, you know, hand to hand. And people would pass through the fire tunnel. Dun, dun, dun. I don't have my sound effects working today. My, um, my mixer went kaput. It has this real bad electrical buzz hum in it. And as you know, I don't like that. So I don't have my sound effects working today. Just add sound effects in there if you want to. Dun, dun, dun. But they're doing fire tunnels. Why? Because there's something coming, people. Something's happening. All of those things in the Bible where you saw they were passing their children through the fire. I'm telling you that there is a time coming when people are going to pass through a fire, literally. Just And when they do these, what do they do? Where in the Bible, where in the Bible are we told as Bible-believing Christians that if we want God to work some new thing in our life, that we have to go through this fire tunnel in order to get it? But that's what they're being told. They're being told that as they pass through this, that each person there representing a fire is, I guess, purifying them in some way or whatever. When they get on the other side, they're clean. And I'm, I'm just thinking, this is so ridiculous. Where did we get the idea that we can be cleansed by people holding hands over each other like this? When, in fact, we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and washed by the water, by the word of God. Not by people in a fire tunnel like this. Kate, you did well and not go into that kind of nonsense. Stay away from it, and especially keep that young boy of yours away from that. That's garbage. That's It's not just garbage. It's dangerous to be part of that. I, I wouldn't go to something like that just because of the spirit's That would be there. But there's a fire coming. A time of fire. And I believe, according to the scriptures, that if you and I are alive at that time, we are going to go through that. Will we get burned? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't. So... Why should we think we're any different? Let's look at let's look at some others um, where this is mentioned. Here's another one: Women in Design, Kansas City presents Ignite, fueling the next generation. Okay, that's not actually a church, but it's the same concept. Have you ever heard of the Burning Man? The Burning Man is a uh, gathering out in uh, just outside of Lost Wages, Nevada. And uh, out in the desert, every year, they build this effigy of of a human, of a man, out of wood. And they have this big festival where literally people, I'll just say it this way, they, they don't believe that the laws apply out at these festivals because they bring large amounts of drugs. Um, people that attend this, usually young people, young, I say young in the sense that probably um, 18 and older, in their 20s, maybe early 30s, attend this. And there are times and places at this festival where where clothing is optional. I mean, and and by the way, there there are conferences and gatherings similar to this rising up all over the country. Um, Las Vegas itself has what's called, I think it's the Electric Daisy. And it's a big festival and rock concert and 
I mean, the drugs that, that are there are just, it's unreal. Cl- uh, optional clothing times, free love, you know what that means, right? It's almost like Woodstock on methamphetamine. And these these festivals, there's one that they have put in in this area, about I'd say about 40 miles south of Festus. Way out in the middle of nowhere, out in this big field, they put on one of these festivals where it's free love and drugs and alcohol and and rock and roll music. And this is what the youth of our generation and our nation are turned into. And all of these, I think, are, are precursors to worshiping the beast. Because I think that's what they're doing when they go to these places, especially the Burning Man. These people are learning, they are worshiping the beast. They build this effigy of this man, they light him on fire, and everybody goes, oh, that's so great, this, I feel so spiritual. The Burning Man is the beast, he's the Antichrist, he's the, think of Shiva. The statue of Shiva outside of CERN features Shiva doing his little dance, surrounded by flames. He is the burning man. And he represents the fire that's coming. And the time of fire and the fiery trial that's coming to this earth. Um... Carlos Santana, his album here, Sacred Fire, live in South America. By the way, this idea of sacred fire, I mean, I've heard, I've, I've read brochures for quote-unquote Christian festivals where people would be invited in the evening to, to go and join the time where they're going to light the sacred fire dance around it, read poetry, and say that they're worshiping God. Not, it's not the same God, though. But it's, it's meant to bring church youth into initiating them into worshiping the beast around this sacred fire. There is a time coming of fire. Isaiah 47, 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now thy, the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators, stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. And behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire, the fire, not a fire, the fire, shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from Notice this, the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. What is that stubble? Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. And I think here, The Holy Ghost is signifying a particular flame, a particular fire. Because he says, the fire and the flame in this passage. Now, he mentions the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators. Um, I've made mention that on August 21st, that there is going to be a solar eclipse. And um, Festus, Missouri, believe it or not, Festus, Missouri is pretty close to ground zero for this event. For a full two and a half minutes, maybe close to three minutes, it is going to be pitch black dark here in Festus during the day for about two and a half minutes. And I plan on 
having cameras rolling. Um, I may, I don't know, I may, they, they're selling special glasses where you can look directly at the sun and see it. I may get a, a special lens for that, for the camera. I don't know. But I, I, plan, I don't plan on letting this go by without doing some sort of recording of it. But do I think it's some big significant event that ushers in the uh, great tribulation and it's gonna, that means Jesus is going to rapture us all out? No, I don't believe that. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. I do not. Uh, you know what? I, I'm not going to. Here again, I'm trying to pull some punches here because I don't want to be mean. But in the past, there has been times when people have suggested that because a certain star was going to be in a certain place or this was going to be here or there, that that must mean something prophetically. And I just don't get all jumpy over that stuff. Remember the four blood moons. Remember that? How many, how many books, how many of the four blood moons books by John Hagee is he selling right now? How many? You think his sales have dwindled some on that book? Because the four blood moons time has come and gone. And nothing has happened with Israel. Nada. Nil. Zero. No invasion of Jerusalem. No... Nu nuclear bombs going off. Nothing. It was nothing. You know why? Because it was hyped. And while they made you think that it was some big fulfillment of Bible prophecy, it wasn't. It never was. And if you look at this verse, let now the astrologers and the stargazers and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. You know what God's saying here? They're, going, they're not going to know about it. They're going to be looking at all these stars and all these uh, things that are happening in the heavens. And God said they're going to miss this one by a mile. They're not going to be able to save thee. It's not going to happen. Joel chapter 2. In fact, get your, get your Bible out again. Get your Bible out. And I want you to turn to the book of Joel. And then I want you to go to, boy, this, I like this. God showed me something today. Uh, the book of Joel, the book of Revelation. In Joel chapter 2, we have uh, Todd Bentley and Joel's army out here. Have you ever, I, I heard about this years ago. D d d uh, Joel's army, we're, we're Joel's mighty army. We're supposed to be in Joel's army. And I thought, you know, is there something I missed from the Bible? Are we supposed to be something? And, you know, I, I don't know it. I have it. And so I read the book of Joel. And I went, I was looking at it, and I'm going, something don't look right here. This mighty army that they're saying that we, as the Christians, are supposed to be, that doesn't look like us. Let's read the pertinent part there on the screen. A fire devoureth before them, and a flame, and behind them a flame burneth. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Hmm. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. See, this is kind of where I, I, I'm going, you know, I don't look like a horse. Just saying, just saying, I don't look like a horse. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. There it is, there's, there's that stubble again. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Now, let's go backward in Joel a little bit to the first chapter. 
If you look in chapter 1 and verse 4, that which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Notice that there's one, two, three, four different types of maggots here, worms. The palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. What does that designate to you? What does that denote to you? The number four. Number one, it, it could be part of a false gospel. I absolutely believe that. Number two, it shows you the spiritual realm. Even the fourth kingdom. It's what that I think that represents. He mentions the locust. If we were to go to Revelation 9. Oh, man, it's getting hot, isn't it? It's getting hot. Revelation 9. Let me find it. My well-torn Bible, worn and torn. Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star, star fall from heaven unto the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This star is not was not just some meteorite that falls. It's not just um, some comet that lands on the earth. This is an entity, a him. It's a, it is, it is a, a personage of some kind. I believe that it is how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. That's who, that's who I think it is. I could be wrong. I've been wrong. Will continue to be wrong. But I think it could be Lucifer. The fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fall from heaven. And there's a connection with the number five too. Um, it's the fifth trumpet. It's going to last for five months. And Lucifer says five things. I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou should be brought down very low is what the Bible says. So here he is falling from heaven. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. Where was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke a locust upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Locusts. And these were not just any ordinary locust. They were spirits. And I've just come to the conclusion that everything here on this earth, the animal kingdoms, especially the ones that you see in the Bible, I believe that they are a representation of things that God has created in heaven, in the spiritual realm. I think they're a representation of spirits. Consider lions, dogs, um, Serpents, dragons, fowls of the air, owls, all of these different creatures that we see listed in the Bible. I think the ones that you and I see, I think they are a representation of what is in the spiritual realm. And so here, and well, there are locusts on the earth, right? There are locusts down in a pit. And these are not just biological entities. These are spirits, very bad, evil spirits. So bad that God keeps them locked up, but for a time. But their appearance is as the appearance of locusts. Now, here's something else I want to throw in too. And I made mention of this last night. The one thing that you and I are looking for as far as the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are looking for him to appear in the clouds. Because that's what, that's what Jesus said. You shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. In the book of Acts, when Jesus ascended up, he ascended up in a cloud. And what did the two angels say? He shall so come again in like manner. 
Uh, Revelation chapter 1, behold, he cometh in the clouds. So we are looking for Jesus to appear in the clouds. God said, and I like this, God said in Genesis 9, when I bring the cloud over the land, you shall see the bow in the cloud. That bow is Jesus. The seven colors of light. Okay? I love that. Mm, mm, mm. Those seven colors, I think, represent the seven spirits of God. The light shining through water droplets is how you get a rainbow. Water is the word of God. Okay? You want a, ra you want a rainbow in your life? Get your Bible out. When you are in the storm of life, and you're not sure you're going to make it, then all you need to do is get your Bible out and read it and believe it. And I promise you, the seven spirits of God will overshadow you, shining through the light of the, of the water, shining its light through the water of the word, and you'll see the rainbow, God's promise in there, and you'll just get happy because you saw that. See, I, I like stuff like this. In, in the um, 66th chapter of the Bible, that would be Exodus 16. 66th chapter of the Bible, you know what you have? Manna introduced for the first time. You know what manna is? It's the word of God. It came from heaven. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, you know what's else? It's in the 66th chapter of the Bible. The glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. Okay? Now, and you know what the glory of the Lord looks like? Ezekiel chapter 1 said that it was the bow in the cloud in the day of rain. This is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Okay? Anyway. I have this little theory. When we, when we see the cloud, we're to look in that cloud for the glory of the Lord, for Jesus, because he's going to be in that cloud. Smoke is not a cloud. Looks like a cloud, but it's actually made of something different. See, a cloud is water, pure water, which is like a representation of the word of God. My, my doctrine shall distill as the dew, right? Okay, that's, I mean, it's the, it's the word of God. Those clouds are the word of God, all right? Smoke is different. Smoke is the carbon remains of, of something that's burnt. It's carbon, black, right? Carbon has um, six electrons and six protons. Pro pro protons? Protrons? And um, six. Neutrons. Okay? Check, check me out. Make sure I'm right on that. But anyway, these locusts, they don't come in the cloud. They come out of the smoke. Those of you who are associated or know of someone who is Native American or First Nations, there is a ritual that most tribes have. Most First Nations or American Indian tribes have a ritual whereby they are bathed and cleansed by smoke. They bring smoke over to them and waft it on them to purify them because of something that's in that smoke, right? 
Your answer to that is right here in your Bible. When he opened the bottomless pit, there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Uh, if you look in verse 7, the shapes of the, of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. That is Joel's army. That's exactly word for word what we read in, in Joel chapter 2, that the appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. That's chapter 2, verse 4. So we're looking at the same thing here. Now, understand this, that when this comes out, according to the book of Joel, a fire devours before them and a flame is, comes in behind them. And before them, it looks like the Garden of Eden. And behind them, it's nothing but a smoky, hazy, burnt wilderness where nothing is left. They devour and consume everything that's in their path. Okay? Now, if you want to stick to the idea that, oh, this is the mighty army of God, and we're Joel's army, and we're, we're going to be the super breed that's going to have our DNA altered, and so we can take over the earth and hand it to Jesus. If you want to keep on hanging on to that, when you just be welcome to it, you're probably not going to like the outcome. But here's what's interesting. I just ripped another page in my Bible. Man, but anyway, here's something that I noticed is that in the trumpet judgments, the first four now, and this is what showed, this is what God showed me this morning, even the fifth trumpet has something to do with fire. And take a look at it. In Revelation chapter 8, if I can read it, because that's the page that I ripped. In Revelation chapter 8, there was in uh, verse 3, And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire uh, of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there are people who are saying, God, please send us fire down from heaven. Look at what happens when, when that happens. There was thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake, and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, I can't get past knowing that when you and I are translated, we are translated at trump number seven. I can't get past that. First Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. At the last trump. That's when we are going to be translated. That's when we're going to be changed. Okay? And I, I just can't get... I, I don't have any other biblical explanation for that. So, when these trumpets are sounding, when the first one is sounded, hail and fire mingle with blood comes to the earth. The second one in verse 8, there's a great mountain burning with fire. There it is again. Uh, the third angel sounded, a great star fell from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. You have a burning, you have a, you have burning hail, you have a burning mountain, now you have a burning star. The fourth angel sounded, the third part of the sun was smitten, burning. Then the fifth angel sounds, his trumpet calls forth 
these locusts coming up out of the smoke of the pit. And according to Joel, a fire devours before them and a flame comes behind them. So in the first five trumpet judgments are related to fire. And I, I can't, again, I, I see that the translation of the church, the rapture happens at the last trump. And by the way, that's not the only reason why I think that it is the seventh and final trumpet that sounds before the wrath of God is poured out in the seven vials of wrath. Now again, I have not said anything about, now that lasts seven years, or that lasts three and a half years. It could last a day. I don't know how long it lasts. I just believe what the Bible says as opposed to what I was always taught or what I myself believed at one time. I've, I've changed my mind on this issue. And I may, be as, I may be as wrong as a $3 bill. And I could very well be. And definitely, there are things that I don't see but for right now, I can't, I can't get past that. Uh, let me look at some emails here. Let's see here. Ah, here we go. This is from Tom. Tom quotes Matthew twenty four twenty nine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, even from one heaven to the one end of heaven to the other. In Luke 17, 24, for as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part of under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. And the, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. It's his glory being revealed. That's what we were reading in First Peter. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then Tom writes, When Christ appears, he is revealed in the clouds after the tribulation of those days. It is the day of the Lord when the mystery of God is finished. That's Revelation 10, um, Revelation 10, 7, I think, when the mystery of God is finished, and he throws in a little sarcasm. He says, oh, I forgot Matthew 24 is not for us. And he says, the problem is dispensationalism is the doctrine taught in most churches. As you know, I left a church over more than one gospel. And Tom, I just, I'm telling you, you did the right thing. I mean, there are dispensationalists that I, I, I agree with them on a lot of things. And there are some who believe in a certain form of dispensationalism that teach that there is only one gospel. I can agree to disagree with them. I don't have to, we don't all have to be cut out of the same, um, the same cookie cutter. God does make us all different, and we're not going to agree on everything because we see through a glass darkly. However, when it comes to people saying there is more than one gospel, now that the Jews, they're saved by a different gospel, and that gospel is preached by an angel flying in heaven during the tribulation days. And when they say that there's two gospels or three or four, that's when I say, I can't go that. That's, that's no, that's anathema. That's a curse. I can't go along with that. And I won't go along with it. Tom, I appreciate that. Somebody is, uh, 
sent me an email saying, what can you say about Stevenson texts? I have no idea what that means. I, I don't have the first clue what that email means. Anyway, so let's move on. Notice, let, let me pull the, uh, let me get the scripture back up here. Let's go to the Bible. Notice that Joel said that, um, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as the strong people set in battle array. Now, what is stubble? I mean, we understand the plain, simple meaning of it. Stubble is like when you go out and cut the grass, you have grass stubble left. Or when you don't shave for a couple of days, you have stubble. And my wife, she won't touch me with a 10-foot pole if I don't shave my face. Got to shave or she won't, she won't give me a kiss. She don't like it. So anyway, but is there another biblical meaning for stubble? Exodus 15, 7. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sendest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Job 20, and this, the stubble here, Exodus 15 is the song sang after Pharaoh and his armies have been drowned in the sea. The, what color sea? The Red Sea. And since it's a sea, an ocean, it has salt water, and salt in the Bible is a type of burning. Definitely, if you've ever had a sore, an open wound on you, and you put salt on it, what is that going to do to you? Ah, that burns! See? Job 21, 17, how oft is the candle of the wicked put out, and how oft cometh their destruction upon them? God distributeth sorrows in his anger. They are as stubble before the wind, and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. Now, let's take that idea right there. They are as stubble before the wind and as chaff that the storm carrieth away. Notice that, and let, let me explain this candle of the wicked. In, I believe that every one of us in our DNA, our DNA is made of phosphorus, which is light. And I believe that our DNA, which is the book that God wrote, is the candle in us of the light of God. God's word is light, and our DNA is light. It's made of phosphorus, for crying out loud, and sugar. Okay? Something's going to happen. Nirvana is going to happen. Why do I say nirvana? Because the word nirvana means to blow out as a lamp or a candle. That's what it means. And nirvana is this state that you're trying to achieve in Hinduism or Buddhism or whateverism. You're trying to uh, meditate your way into this void into this place of the of the total nothing of non-existence called nirvana and that state represents a person whose candle is blown out it represents the dna no longer being full of light it could very well be that the, alt the future alteration of man's DNA blows his candle out. Okay? Something to think about. But the wicked are the stubble, and they are as the chaff that's carried away. Now get your Bible back out and go to Matthew chapter 13 Matthew 13 Oh this Bible is rich This Bible is it's beautiful 
if you would if you would just spend time every day that you can reading making notes just writing things down from the bible writing bible verses down on paper that you like studying the bible getting knowledge of the bible the more you study you're going to get understanding because you're going to see that verses are linked to it's just like now i'm reading this and i'm going to stubble there as the stubble before the wind is chaff the storm careth well i know where chaff and stubble and things like that are mentioned think of um in matthew chapter 13 and I am thinking of like two things here. This is one of them. Uh, let's see here. Verse 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Non-GMO. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat also, uh, root up the wheat with them so let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of harvest i will say to the reapers get ready gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn what comes first? The gathering of the wheat, which is the saints, born of the incorruptible seed, or the wicked, which are the tares, which are gathered in bundles and burned. Fire. Which comes first? The gathering of the saints or the fire that precedes that. It, I just said it. The fire does. Um, what John the Baptist. Let me see if I can find that. John or Johnny the Baptist said concerning Jesus. Uh, yeah, here we go. In Matthew chapter 3. John said in John chapter uh, 311, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. I believe that a fire baptism is coming. A fire baptism. Look at what it says in verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his weed into the garner. That's the second time we've read this now. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Dun, dun, dun. There's your sound effect for the day. That's who the chaff are, and that's what happens to them. They are burned up with an unquenchable fire. Psalm chapter 83, verse 1, Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So we find then in the same chapter, verse 12, who said, Let us... Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. Oh, my God, make them like a wheel. You know what? I just can't. I, I can't go past this. Make them as a wheel. 
Have you ever heard of yoga? No, not yogurt. Okay. Yoga. You ever heard of yoga? Do you know what the word yoga means? The word yoga, I think, is where we get the word yoke. Be not unequally yoked together, Paul said. Because the word yoga means a yoke. That's what it means. It means a, like a connection. And the idea is that you practice yoga in order to connect to Shiva or Shakti or any of those gods. But you make a connection with the gods by way of yoga. And there is something that every yoga practitioner wants to happen. Now, I've been studying yoga. I've been making some notes. I haven't put anything together yet. But I, I, I want to, and maybe present it like in a pastor mic online or a watchman broadcast, simply as a way of trying to talk some really good people out of yoga classes. Because... Even at the YMCA, they, uh, by the way, YMCA, the C of YMCA it means Christian. Even at the YMCA, they teach yoga classes. They don't teach it as a religious thing. It's merely about stretching and breathing. Well, did you know that the practitioners of yoga, the original ones, from Hindu religion, believe that by the motions and works of the body, you can achieve godliness by the works of the flesh. Think about it. That's what, the, that's what all this is. Stretching and moving the body and wrapping your legs around the back of your head and stuff like that. But in yoga... There is a form of yoga called kundalini yoga. You know what kundalini is? Kundalini teaches that in your body, you have seven wheels. Seven chakras. And these wheels are like energy vortexes. They're wheels. You know, what the, you know what they really are? Seven spirits. Not, no, 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 no. Not the seven spirits of God. Seven devils. Like what Mary Magdalene had. Seven devils. That's what these... Chakras are. They're seven unclean, evil, bad, nasty spirits. Look at that verse again. God is going to take these people who are going to try to cut off Israel from being a nation. You and I are Israel. We are, we are in Israel. We are part of Israel. Not by birth, but by second birth, by faith. These people who are going to do that, God said, I'm going to make, oh God, make them like a wheel. Dun, dun, dun. As the stubble before the wind. As the fire burneth the wood and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. Burn them up like stubble, God. That's, who the, that's what the stubble is that Joel's army is going to burn. It's meant as a burning of all of the wicked people on the earth. Look at Isaiah 5.11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink that continue until night till wine inflame them. How many of you have ever drank 
And you know it to be true that wine inflames you. Let's talk about let's talk about that in a couple couple of ways. Wine and strong drink inflame certain passions that people have. Guys out on a date with a girl. He's going to try to talk her into it. So he's going to he's going to pay for the drinks. I'll put it that way. He's going to pay for the drinks because his hope is is that the wine and the strong drink that he gives this girl is going to inflame her desires, number one. And number two, get her just a little bit drunk so she's not near as choosy as she normally would be. Am I, am I saying it right? Am I telling the truth? Those of you that drink or have drank, have drunk, those of you that used to get drunk, say it that way, wine and strong drink tend to inflame anger. You know, there's a boxing glove in every bottle, right? Wine and strong drink will inflame passions. It will inflame anger. It will inflame jealousy. The guy's drunk. The woman's not doing anything. And the guy's going, who are you looking at? Who are you looking at? You look, are you looking at some other guy? You, don't you look at some other guy? He's drunk. The wine inflamed is jealousy. You see what I'm saying? That's what wine does. It, it inflamed. By the way, think about it. Think about how true this is. Wine and whiskey. And vodka, they catch on fire. They have alcohol in them. You light alcohol, and it goes. Pfft. Am I right? They see it. That Bible, that Bible is right in how it's. It's right. You think the more you think about it, the more you understand how right that Bible. Alcohol catches on fire, and alcohol inflames people. Reading emails again. George <laughs> says, look at the end of Joel's army. Joel chapter 2, verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. They are the northern army. Uh, Hap says, uh, carbon is 666 death. What a great comparison of clouds to smoke. I jumped out of my chair. God is so amazing. <laughs> I wish we could have seen that one. Okay. Um, David writes in and says, hey, Pastor Mike, I love your talk show. I love the Pure Bible Search app. It's been such a blessing. The same church in England had a guest speaker come from another Elim church. I don't know what an Elim church is. E-L-I-M. And he promoted a book by Bill Hybels called The Whispering God. My dad started using the Pure Bible Search app, and we were all shocked at what we found referring to whispers. For me, that was the last time I went to that church. The Whispering God. You, do you know what he's referring to? Uh, thank you, David and Joshua. Let me... Um, let me show you that. The whispering God. You know, I would like to see what that book is about. Isaiah 29.4. Let me put it on the screen for you. Isaiah 29.4. Look right here. And thy voice shall be brought down and shalt speak out of the ground, and thy speech shall be low out of the dust. And thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground, and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Whispers. Now, and, and some would say, well, God speaks in whispers. 
Where? Well, you know, the, you know, the Elijah heard the still small voice of God. That's a whisper. No, it's not. There's a difference. Whisper is speech without voice. It's like this. It's talking, but it's not using its voice. What Elijah heard was not a whisper. He heard a still, small voice. Not a whisper. He heard a voice, which was the voice of God. God does not speak in whispers. Familiar spirits do. They speak in whispers. Appreciate that. That's, that's good. Um, Steve. How you doing, Steve? Says, I remember first going to this church in 20 Val. He sends a uh, YouTube link. And I don't play YouTube links during Pastor Mike Online because... If it's using somebody else's material, it gets flagged. YouTube has a conniption and an epileptic seizure, and they can't handle it. So they flag my video for using somebody else's. And then I have to explain to them, this is for educational purposes. So anyway, um, anyway, he says, I remember going to this church in 2012, and I was easily drawn into the culture, especially lifting up the man as uh, Pastor Ben was often addressed as apostle or prophet or holy man of God. Can I, tell you, can I tell you something? You know what that is, Steve? That's a cover. That's a cover. That guy, this Pastor Ben, that guy is, I, I, and I'm some... I'm, I can't see as, I'm not, I'm not closing my eyes going, oh, I see him, oh, I see him. Oh, yeah, God's given me a bit. I don't, I don't do that. What I know is what the Bible says. The false prophets, their eyes are full of adultery. This guy, wanting everybody to call himself the holy man of God, the apostle, the prophet, that's a cover. I recognize it. He's covering himself up with these spiritual titles to make himself look good. But the truth of it is, this guy is a this guy is nasty, dirty, filthy reprobate. This guy's got dirty deeds written all over him that you don't know about. That he covers up with titles like apostle and prophet and holy man of God. That's a that's a cover up. I'm telling you, every fiber of my being tells me that with this kind of flattering titles that this guy has, it's a cover-up for his dirty, nasty little secret sins. I guarantee you he's got them. Guarantee you. He says, I recall being promoted in a sense to, the pastor's, to be the pastor's Bible bearer. He would often dress extravagantly and with every service call down fire. See? Supernatural fire. And then the people would wiggle around and convulse as if being burned. And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit brought me out of that cult. I found a video of Pastor Ben. The fire calling is around the 3 minute 25 second mark. And throughout the 11 minute video, he is still calling down fire and leading many astray to this day. Steve, I'll... Uh, I'll look at the, and by the way, I like how Steve addresses himself. Steve, a wretched, low-down, dirty dog of a sinner who was found by grace and washed in the blood of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the earth, Jesus, the truth, the way, the life, amen, King James Bible believer. I love it. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Yeah. The wisp, wisp, I already read that one. I already read that one. Anyway, hey, good emails. Good responses here today. Let's uh, let's move along here. What God to the inflaming alcohol inflaming people? Isaiah five twenty one to them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and pruned in their own sight. The, the last uh, two PMOs that I was dealing with this. Uh, these two female spirits uh, from the book of Proverbs. The 
Sophia Shekinah spirit, which is the strange woman. They call her Sophia because she is the goddess of wisdom. And that if any man has wisdom, he gets it from this goddess called Sophia. And, but it's the wisdom of this world. And in verse 21 here, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The spirit that has given them this self-righteous, exalted wisdom that they have is Sophia. It's not the Bible. It's not heaven. It didn't come from heaven. It came from hell. That's where it came from. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. We are talking both about spiritual drunkenness and physical drunkenness. It works either way. And those pastors, preachers, and evangelists, and prophets, and holy men of God, and apostles, and all that junk, that are talking about bringing fire down from heaven, and this and that and the other, they are the ones who justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. How so? They are catering to the sodomite crowd because they know that the sodom once once you get once you get it known in the sodomite community that your church doesn't condemn homosexuals they will fill your church pews with every kind of person you can think of, which means money in the plate. That's what that means. That's why they do it. It's all about the love of money. When you dumb down the sermons and tone down the, the hate rhetoric, they call it, and you start favoring sodomite marriage, you actually perform them, though they will, through their network, fill your church and bring big sacks of money with them. They'll write large checks. Okay? They will. They justify the wicked, wicked for the wicked. The Rickards. <laughs> they justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, these are, see, these are the stubble preachers. And the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. This, people, listen to me. Please, I plead with you. The churches, the pastors, the preachers, the evangelists, the holy prophets, the holy men of God, the, the apostles, all of these big money ministries and these ecumenical movements, all of them have one thing in common. They all despise King James Bible. They hate that book. They've turned away from it. They don't touch it. They don't read it. They won't preach it. Under the, under the spiritual sounding disguise of, well, people in this generation wouldn't understand it. That's why we don't use it. So it sounds good. Oh, we're, we're doing it for God and the people. Sound spiritual. The truth of it is, they hate it. They've despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. They've cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. And because they've done that, they then go and justify the wicked for reward, take away the righteousness of the righteous from him, because our righteousness comes from the word of God. So they've taken that away from people. And they call good evil, and they call evil good. They put light for darkness and darkness for light. They take 
Bibles that have the corruption of the Vatican in it. And they say, this is the Bible. But the truth of it is, those books are nothing but pure darkness. And they call that light, while they call the King James Bible darkness. Why? Because they say, you can't understand it. That's darkness. And God said, as the flame devoureth the stubble, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to devour them. I'm going to send fire to this earth, the likes of which has never been seen on this earth. And I'm going to show you from the Bible what this fire is. I'm going to show you from the Bible what, this, what these fire tunnels are where all of these preachers and apostles and Latter-day prophets, they're all saying, we're going to call the fire of God down from heaven. We're going to bring the fire down from heaven. There is a, a, a god in Greek mythology called Prometheus. You remember what Prometheus did? Prometheus saw that the gods in heaven had fire. And he saw that the humans didn't. So he felt like that was unfair. So he, on his own, decided that he was going to bring fire down from the gods and give it to mankind as a gift so that man could have fire. And Manly Hall will tell you, if Manly Hall were alive here today, sitting in this talk show, Hell Hates, Area 52, Manly Hall would tell you that Prometheus is a veiled reference to a time when there is going to be fire on the earth, but it's the fire of divinity. The transformation, see, fire is trans, it transforms, transformative is the word I was looking for. Fire transforms things. And Manly Hall would say that the story of Prometheus is there is coming a time when the fire of transformation is going to uh, rule this world and man is going to be transformed and he's going to be a divine being. That's what the story of Prometheus is all about. And these preachers and these apostles and these latter-day prophets, they're all talking about the same thing, how the fire, they want the fire of God to come down from heaven, want the fire from heaven to come down and, and baptize us all and transform us all into gods, into Joel's army, into super beings, super Christians. We need, we're going to have our DNA changed. And see, some of the churches and some of the conferences, they're already talking about this. They're already telling everybody, that we need, to, we need a DNA change in the church. We need to change the DNA of the church. Folks, the DNA of the church is the Bible. As far as I can see, they've already done it. They've already changed the DNA of most churches because they've changed the Bible that produces these churches. They've changed it from the pure vine of Christ, the line of manuscripts, where most of the Bibles in history came from, and they've changed it to a new text that for 15, 16, 1700 years had been hidden away from mankind. If you, if you believe that the Vaticanus document was the original Bible, then you believe that, it had, that God allowed it to be hidden 
in the Catholic Church up until the 1500s because nobody, and I mean nobody, there is no record anywhere of anybody seeing the Vaticanus document prior to the 1500s. The Sinaiticus, Chris Pinto, will tell you. That's what he was telling here. The Sinaiticus Greek New Testament wasn't seen by anybody before 1850. Is it real? Is it the real word of God? And if it is, if it really is the best manuscript, then why did God let it be hidden away for over 1,800 years? Why did God do that? Why did God let some of the greatest minds and men in Christian history not have access to the best manuscripts. Why did God allow them, number one, to be hidden away? Number two, why did God allow the Roman Catholic Church to have them? Why not his saints? Why not? Something else for you to think about. But these new preachers and these new churches and these new movements, they're already talking about transformation, DNA change, fire coming down from heaven. Let me show you something. Go to, um, go to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. That which was is that which shall be. There is no new thing under the sun. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also at the coming of the Son of Man. In Genesis 7, we find something out. We find out where all the water came from that flooded the entire circle of the earth where did it come from genesis 7 11 they have great nachos there by the way genesis 7 11 in the 600th year of noah's life in the second month in the 17th day of the month the same day where all the fountains of the great deep opened up and the windows of heaven were opened two sources for the water Number one, the pit opened up. The surface of the earth cracked. And large volumes of water began to shoot up from underneath the earth. They began to come up and flood the earth. Then, the windows of heaven were open. God went open the window and large volumes of rain began to fall down on the earth and it did this for 40 days and water everywhere now turn to revelation 9 We've already looked into this, but we're going to look at it again in this context. Revelation 9, verse 1, the angel, the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star, by the way, fifth angel, in five months. Did you know that the days of Noah were exactly five months? Let's, let's look at it. Hold your place there in Revelation 9. Let's go back to Genesis. That it went from, the flood waters went from the 17th day. Let's see here. 
Okay. It started, he gave the exact date, the 600th year of Noah's life, and the 17th day of the second month is when the waters started. You go to chapter 8, and in um, verse 4, the ark rested on the seventh month and the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. If you look at verse 24 of chapter 7, the waters prevailed upon the earth in 150 days. That means for 150 days, the waters kept going up. And then after day 150, they started going back down again. Five months, exactly. Exactly five months in the days of Noah. Here in Revelation 9, if you look in verse 5, and to them was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. It's exactly the exact same amount of time as it was in the days of Noah. Dun, dun, dun. And where did these beasts come from? Under the earth. Turn to Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Um, verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Stars are big fireballs. They're fire. Our star, the sun, is, goodness gracious, great balls of fire. What it is, right? What are angels made of? What are they made of? Psalm 104.4, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. Psalm 105.32, he gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. Remember in Revelation 8, when the first trumpet sounds, hail and fire fall to the earth. Here, in Psalm 105, he gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. Flaming fire is the exact same word that's used in Psalm 104 verse 4 to describe spirits. Flaming fire. That's what they're made of. He maketh his angel spirits and his ministers a flaming fire. That's their substance. That's the, like the, the flesh that they're made of is a, like a spiritual realm fire. So think about it. In the days of Noah, what covered the earth came up from beneath the earth from the ground and it fell down from heaven. In Revelation 9, these flaming fire spirits come up from the ground. And then in Revelation 12, we see them falling down to the earth, just like the days of Noah. For five months that happens. Wow. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ flaming god is going to use flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not god and on them that obey not the gospel of our lord jesus christ he's going to use flaming fire people so let's let's put this together for a minute The fire that all of these prophets and holy men of God and these apostles want to come, want is the fire that they want it to come down from heaven. What is it that God's going to send them? He's going to send them angels, but not good ones, evil ones. Devils, flames, uh, flaming fire spirits are going to be falling down upon the earth just like hail and rain 
all these songs where they're talking about the oh where the latter rain oh we want it to rain let it rain let it rain open the floodgates of heaven let it rain and they sing it 4800 times and everybody gets worked into this emotional frenzy right i think that fire that falls down to the earth that comes up from the from the deep i think that fire are these devils these spirits that come up and humans are going to join with them. They are the fourth kingdom. And they are going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what I think is going to happen. Let me read some more emails if you've sent them in to me. Ooh. David sent me some blogs, one called the Fire-Breathing Christian. Is this a video, David, that I'm pulling up here? No, just a blog. Guy calls himself a Fire-Breathing Christian. Hmm. Uh, huh. That's interesting. Okay, I'll have to look more into that. I appreciate that. Uh, Kurt, whose name for me is Hoggy San, they say uh, namaste in yoga, meaning I bow to the divine in you. And he sent me a, a screen capture of Wikipedia article, namaste, sometimes spoken, uh, whatever, in a re is a respectful form of greeting in Hindu. Uh, let's see here. It is used both for salutation and valediction. Um, but it literally means I bow to the divine in you. And see, that's what, that's what, that's what these people, that's what they're practicing. And the reason why I am, I'm so adamant against yoga and against churches doing yoga is that I I get it I I've read just enough I to know what it is I've not read the whole Bhagavad Gita nor do I, am I inclined to nor do I I don't have a desire to I just know enough to know that yoga yokes you to a familiar spirit and you are yoked together with you you are light and you're communing with darkness for crying out loud. You've got this, supposedly have the spirit of Christ in you, which I seriously doubt. And yet you're practicing yoga where you are connecting to familiar spirits, to gods, to devils. And that's what, and saying all these words, you have no idea. Because see, yoga and the reason why they use all these terms in Sanskrit is that they are, they are also a group of people who believe in a special, holy, sacred tongue that if you speak it, then it invokes the powers so that you can have them. And it's no different than the belief that if you speak in an unknown gibberish, that you're actually reaching God in a deeper way, and God is going to respond more favorably to you than if you just prayed a prayer in your natural tongue, whether it's English or Swahili, or you speak Turkana, or you speak whatever dialect it is you speak. They teach you that you speak in this unknown language that you have no idea what the words mean, and that you're going to get in, in a deeper connection with God because of it. That's no different than the Hindu teaching that Sanskrit, and the reason why they must use these Sanskrit words is because it is a special, secret, holy tongue that, when, that the use of it invokes the powers of these divine gods that you're trying to get in contact with. It's the same thing as the 
Hebrew root, sacred name, cult. And that's exactly what it, it's exactly what it is. It's a cult. Do you know why? The, the word cult comes from the word occult. And occult means hidden. And there is this constant idea in the Hebrew Roots movement that God has all these hidden meanings in these Hebrew words, in the Hebrew grammatria, and in the, the letters themselves have these little pictures. And the letters themselves have these little numbers. And when you uh, add these numbers up, you get this new hidden meaning that just plain people reading their Bible would never get. You know what? I agree with that part of it. You're getting an occult meaning, all right, that us just reading the Bible, we would never see that. And you know what? I want to keep it that way. I think you ought to just read your Bible. I think you ought to think Bible. Can I get some people to shout amen? Pray for us. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a Watchmen video broadcast coming out this Sunday. I haven't recorded it yet. Things just keep popping up. So I'm going to try to record it this evening. I'm going back to, I think, we're going to go back to our rapture series. I think. Maybe God has something else in mind. We'll see. All right? Uh, We'll see you Sunday morning. Come join us for Sunday school and church, Sunday morning Bible time. Man, you, if you haven't if you haven't joined us, you're missing out. Now, if you go to a church, that's fine. You go to your church. But get on Facebook when you come home. You can watch the whole service after we're done with it because it gets posted to facebook.com slash Pastor Mike online. All right? Think Bible. I love you guys. The reason why we do what we do. Think Bible. Don't think anything else.